Hey, good morning. Well, it's such a joy, it's a privilege, it's an honor to be here with you guys this morning. And um, I've heard a lot about this church and this fellowship through my dear friend, Jana Williams, has, has boasted on your behalf. So I am uh, really, truly blessed to be able to share from God's Word and to meet you all and to hear about what God is doing here in Somerset, Pennsylvania. Uh, I met Jana in, in a unique way. She went to Cambodia first, and quite frankly, I don't even know how she went to Cambodia. Someday you'll have to tell me. But after she came back from Cambodia, she connected with me. You see, we've been working in the nation of Cambodia since 1994. God has given us an opportunity to do a lot of great things there in that nation. Um, but it's very rare that people in the United States go to Cambodia first and then come to me and I get to meet them then. Typically, I meet folks in Cambodia and then by God's grace, smuggle them out of this country and send them to Cambodia. So it was great to meet her when she came back and she was telling me all of the things that God was doing in her life while she was there. She had met some friends in Cambodia while she was traveling. And I, I said, well, this is fantastic. I said, so what are you going to do? And she said, well, I'm going back there. I said, okay. And this young lady went back and traveled to each of the children's homes that we serve. At that time, we're 14 different children's homes in 14 different provinces of one of the craziest countries on the planet. And I would get pictures back of her like in a canoe going down a stream in the middle of nowhere, Cambodia, with a big smile on her face. And I'd hear stories from our kids in the children's homes about how much they love this Jana Williams. It impressed me so much, and I'm forever grateful to your love for the kids and for that nation and your heart for missions. So thank you, my friend. I want to honor your parents. Thank God huh, that, that they were plucked out of Nevada and shipped here to Somerset, PA. Isn't God faithful, huh? Let's give them a round of applause for doing that. Um, I'm from Oakmont, Pennsylvania. My parents are from Oakmont, Pennsylvania. My grandparents are from Oakmont, Pennsylvania. I've tried to escape Oakmont, Pennsylvania many, many times, but all roads lead back there. My wife, Jessica, and my two sons, Joshua and Rocco, are here this morning. If you guys want to stand up real quick so everyone can see you. I know that they can't wait to change the, from those shirts. How many of you have, have sons? Uh-huh, uh-huh. Eight-year-old boys really are not delighted with button-down shirts. But I'm so proud of these two boys. They, of course, have gone out into the mission field uh, and have, have been throughout Asia, have, done, have been used of God to do marvelous things in their own right. So just we don't get a lot of time to visit churches together, so this is really a special day for us. Um, Oakmont, Pennsylvania is where we live as a family. It's where the ministry I serve, the Southeast Asia Prayer Center. Our U.S. office is in Oakmont, Pennsylvania. This ministry was founded by my parents, Mark and Ellie Geppert. Now my dad heard the voice of the Lord go and preach my gospel in the nations way back in 1976. When he heard that voice, at the time, he was Cosmo of Cosmo's Pizza Shop in Murraysville, PA. So Cosmo hears a voice from God, go and preach, I'm calling you to preach my gospel in the nations. And he called my mom, 1976, and said, hey, I think I'm freaking out. And she said, why, what's going on? And he said, I'm to sell the pizza shop today, and we're to go be missionaries. And I'm sure she said, yeah, I think you are freaking out. They prayed. She had confirmed to her in dreams that that's what they were supposed to do. So they sold the pizza shop to a guy named Guido. The pizza shop's still there in Murraysville, if you ever want to visit, Cosmo's Pizza Shop. Sold the business, went to Bible school, and in 1976, sold everything they had and drove to Guatemala. My mom was six months pregnant with my older brother at the time. They went to the mission field. Sam was born in Guatemala. I, they say I was made in Guatemala, but was born in the United States. 
uh, started this journey in missions. My father and mother found out from the Lord as they were learning how to be missionaries, they found out that prayer, prayer is in fact the practice that leads us to success. I love the drama, I love the skit, and a, a practice makes perfect. Prayer is our practice, our portion. This is why we're called the Southeast Asia Prayer Center. And we are a prayer ministry first, and then a missions ministry. I'm so grateful that this church has a heart and a tradition and a heritage for Christian missions. No nation in the history of the world has done more than the United States in advancing the kingdom of God. Our God is faithful to this nation, and He will pour out His Spirit on this nation yet again. Prayer is the practice that leads us to success in missions. Prayer is the practice that leads us to success in our lives. When we want to see our families changed, our communities changed, the nation changed, prayer is in fact our priority. Meeting the needs of the people through missions, you better believe it, we're called to do that. But prayer is our positioning. So we're the Southeast Asia Prayer Center. Now, I want to tell you a little bit about prayer, what this means to me. If I said, Lord, okay, why prayer? Why prayer? Began reading through the Gospel of John. Here he is, turning water into wine, healing the blind eye, Walking on water, doing these things. How many of you want to see someone walk on water? All right, I'll be the only one. I'm the only one in the church who would like to watch somebody walk on water. Come on, give me a break. Let's try this again. How many of you would like to watch somebody walk across water? All right, yeah, that little man right there. What's your name, son? Ezra. Ezra. You and me want to see someone walk on water, right? Man, I do. That'd be the coolest thing in the world. So these guys, Peter, these guys actually watch him walk on the water. That's amazing. That's amazing. I was shocked when I got to the end of the gospel and I didn't see where Peter said, Jesus, teach me how to walk on water. Wouldn't you have asked him how to walk on water? I would have. That's crazy. You just walked across a lake. Teach me how to do that. That's crazy. You just turned water into wine. Teach me how to do that. You just opened their eyes by spitting mud. Teach me how to do that. Wouldn't you have asked that? No. These guys didn't ask him any of those questions. Isn't that amazing? Think about that for a second. They didn't ask him any of those questions. What did they ask him? They said, teach us how to pray. Teach us how to pray. I would have said, teach me how to walk on water. Because that's going to be cool. They said, teach us how to pray. Why do you think they did that? They knew. They knew. This guy, Jesus, would row the boat out into the middle of the lake and pray. This guy, Jesus, would hike up to the mountain and pray. This man would do, would come from those places and do things that the world had never seen before. They knew where the source was, a place of prayer. So an encouragement today, we're going to talk about going into all the earth, but an encouragement today if you want to see the things that are in the book be made real on these streets in Somerset, Pennsylvania and in the nation and around the world, ask the Lord, teach me how to pray. There's an impossible situation in front of my life. Maybe you're saying that. There's a sickness. There's a poverty. There's addiction. There's an impossible situation. Asking God, teach you how to pray. That's the key. We'll get to that. We'll get to that. All right, I'm a missions kid. 
So I grew up bouncing around all these crazy, crazy situations and crazy countries and thinking, wow, this is amazing. At the same time, this is absolutely crazy. My father would take us into um, nations that, where you weren't allowed to talk about Jesus. You weren't allowed to preach the gospel. You weren't permitted by the laws in that land to share Jesus Christ. When I was six years old was the first time that I smuggled Bibles into China. My father took us to Hong Kong, we picked up Bibles, and we walked across the border to deliver Bibles to Christian Chinese people in the nation of China. I'll never forget it. I had a jean jacket. I can't believe those things are cool again. They came back. I had a jean jacket that had little pockets sewn in through the jean jacket, and we put Bibles inside of my jean jacket. My mother had a, 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 a slip that went under a long dress, and the slip had pockets in it that was full of Bibles. I remember when she would walk, it would go like this and come back. And we smuggled these Bibles across the border from Hong Kong into China to meet little Chinese people who just wanted to hear more about Jesus Christ. My dad made it so much fun we thought we were like James Bond, you know, he made it like a spy game. And we had back then, oh, I wish we would have had these things, man. We didn't have MapQuest or, you know, we didn't even use this MapQuest. We didn't have Google Maps or, 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 you know, Instant Messenger or any of these things. No, man, this is the 80s. We had a piece of paper with a map and a phone number. And if the person wasn't there to meet us, there's nothing we could do. Go home and write a letter. This is back in the day. But my dad would pull out that folded map and the streets of China were, were, writ, were designed on that map. And we would follow the map to these houses, these apartments. We'd come into the apartments. Some of the apartments we would drop off the, the Bibles that we brought. Some of the other apartments we would pick up Bibles there, like cash houses. A totally empty apartment just with a stack of Bibles in the middle. Picture that. We'd pick them up. And we deliver them to a house church in another city. Looking back on it, it was fascinating what those people would do just to have the Bible. Just to have the training manual. Just to know how to practice. They would risk their lives. In 1988, my father took me and my brother and my mom into Beijing, China. We went to the Forbidden City. We walked and prayed in Beijing. And we visited a tiny little house church there outside of Beijing. When we went to this church, I'll never forget it. I was eight years old. We came in and there was just a, a really old woman, an elderly woman and her brother inside of the building. It had a dirt floor. It had window frames, but there were no windows inside of the frames. We came into this place and the, little old, the elderly woman was hunched over and, and she walked over to my brother and I, and Chinese woman, Chinese woman, and her eyes, you know, in China, all, the eyes are all brown. Her eyes were turning blue. They had the cataracts over top of the pupils. And I can never, I will never forget this. She looked down into my brother and I, into our eyes, and thanked us for bringing the Bibles to her. And my father said, her name was Mabel, said, Auntie Mabel, would you please pray for my boys? So she prayed for us. And my father said, would you, would you mind telling them your story? And Mabel shared with us how her, she and her brother were arrested. She was a professor at the university there in Beijing. She was arrested and she was beaten by the police. She's thrown into prison. For many years she lived in prison. And now she had been released and was to live in this home. My father asked her if she would show us the scars. And Mabel, her brother, lifted up the back of her shirt. And I could see down her back the scars where she had been beaten just to have that book just to know that there is a God who has a son whose name is Jesus who died for them. She knew that we were shaken. Obviously, I still 
thinking back on that moment, become emotional. She knew that my brother and I were shaken by the experience. And she looked back down into my eyes and she said, I never felt one whip. I never felt it when they beat me. And she, t she told us that we were brave for doing what we were doing. I knew at that time that I would serve the church in China for the rest of my life. The government of China, no thanks. We won't go too deep into that. I could care less for the government of China. There are also many governments closer to home that I could care less for too. We won't get too deep into that. Jesus. Jesus. If we pray and put our trust in Him and put our lives in line with His will and plan for our lives, that we will do mighty things that will change the nations. Many people are asking, how do we see our government change? There's an assumption that the nations follow the government. I'm here today to declare that that is not true. The government is not in charge of this land, nor is it in charge of China. It is the church of Jesus Christ that leads this nation since its foundation and so long as it remains. The government follows the church. The government follows the church. Auntie Mabel and her friends went wild all over China. And the gospel of Jesus Christ spread out until hundreds of millions people, of million people knew that there is a God and knew how to pray. I was arrested in China for the first time when I was 14 years old, smuggling Bibles across the Karakoram Highway into western China with my parents, with my family. We were stopped at the border and we were arrested. This was 1994. But we were pulled aside and interrogated. My father was interrogated. The man took my father's Bible. And my dad said, no, you can't have that. And he said, but why do you want it? Why do you want it? And the government official who had arrested us at that time looked at my father and said, we won't let you do it, hear what you did in Russia. And my dad said, well, what, what did we do in Russia? And the man said, if they have this book, they'll believe. And if they believe, there's nothing we can do to stop them. That's the report of the Chinese government. If they have this book, they'll believe. And if they believe, there's nothing we can do to stop them. When I look at this nation that we're serving here today, I'm in the midst of something called Pray Americas, mobilizing prayer in every state, in every capital, in every community across the United States. My hope is that again we'll come to the place of prayer. Because we have that book in our hands. We know those scriptures well, don't we? How do we again come to that belief how do we again rise up into that belief that is unstoppable, that no force can touch? Prayer, prayer, prayer. In 1998, we were invited by the, go the government of China to find kids with congenital heart disease and provide treatment for them across Tibet. It came out of a wild prayer, a pr prayer journey in the mountains of Tibet. We were invited. We partnered with Children's Hospital of Pittsburgh and we brought doctors there to Tibet to close holes in hearts. For 10 years, we brought doctors up and, and we would treat the kids who had holes in their hearts there in Tibet. The same nation that I was arrested in in 1994 now invited me personally as a liaison to bring in health care across China. For 10 years, we treated these kids, and at the end of 10 years, a comprehensive health program was established in Tibet. 
On the day that I left Tibet in 2012, there were 336 new churches that had been birthed out of that across the Tibetan plateau. I was flown from Lhasa, Tibet, to Beijing, China, invited by the healthcare department of the People's Republic of China to dinner. The dinner was inside of the Forbidden City. As an honored guest of the People's Republic of China, I walked into that Forbidden City, remembering Mabel, remembering the faithful ones who had stood in the gap, and I sat down in the Forbidden City and was served lobster. Lobster in China. And the Lord reminded me of those years and said, Matthew, I can turn the heads of kings on your behalf. I can make a way. I can change anything. Right now, I really pray for China. I really pray for that nation because there are believers all across that nation who are this close to flipping that whole country in revival. There are leaders in the government who I have personally led to Christ, who are seated in high places, who are just on the cusp of changing this nation for good. I want to ask a, a crazy thing. I would assume talking about the government of China in Somerset, Pennsylvania isn't a popular thing. That's just an assumption. I know in Oakmont, Pennsylvania, where I live, it's not a popular thing. I would make an assumption that it's not too cool to talk positively about the government of China in Somerset, PA. Am I accurate? Am I accurate here? And I certainly am not here to promote that government by any means. Evil, corrupt, manipulative. Oddly similar to governments closer to home. But I am here to represent that church in that nation and those brothers and sisters who are every day on their knees asking God for help. I am here to represent them. One of the house churches has sent a request, a request to me one time asking for carpet for their church. I thought, carpet for the church? Man, there's a whole lot of other things that we can help. You guys are in poverty. I'm thinking of this church. You guys are in poverty. Let's go get to carpet. Let's deal with food and health care. And, and let's take care of those things first. Clean water. Then we'll get to carpet. They said, no, no, no. We need $100 for carpet for the church in China. I said, well, I'm going to wait on this for a while. But I, I was traveling through China. And I went and I visited the church. They invited me to come and share in their house church meeting. Great honor, great privilege. So I came into the meeting. And I walked in and I was a guest and they moved me over. And, you know, not a large room by any means. They moved me over and they, they sat me down and everyone was seated. And there, was, there weren't chairs. Everyone was seated on the floor. There weren't chairs. And I noticed that we're on a cement floor. But in the front of it, there was a, a portion of carpet that was at the front. And when I got towards the front and I sat near it, I looked. And that carpet was worn thin with knee marks of the saints praying in that place. That was the easiest hundred dollars I ever spent in my life. They knew that if they would pray, God would hear their prayers. And they knew that if God hear, heard their prayers, they were unstoppable. My hope today is that we, friends, would believe that we would commit ourselves to prayer. I work in a communist nation of Cambodia. We, we serve... Eight thousand, uh, first, we started with eight public schools with 4,000 students and 178 teachers. We came there walking and praying. Uh, the Lord made an opportunity for us 
to bring a curriculum from my local high school into that public school. We said, the only way we'll come is if we're allowed to pray in this public school. They said, fine, you can pray. So we came, and the superintendent of the public school, Mr. Bunheng is his name, prayed with my father, and he was miraculously healed in his back during the prayer. And he gave his life to Jesus and became a Christian. When he became a Christian, he determined in his heart he would lead all the other teachers to Christ, all 173. They became Christians. We started the Lord's Prayer in public schools in Rangko Village in Bante Minche province of Cambodia in those eight public schools with 4,000 students. Wouldn't you know those schools became ranked number one in the nation for mathematics and science? The government said, what's going on in Bante Minche? The national government said, we have to come and figure this out. You know, when they came to us, we said, we have this great program, we've got this great curriculum, we have mathematics, we have science, this is incredible. When they asked the local people, they said, no, 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 we have Jesus. We have prayer. So the government came and, and checked this thing out. They said, this is way out in the village. You guys shouldn't be ranked number one in the nation for math and science. They invited us to come because they wanted to give us an award for the work that had been done. So we flew over there. It was a hot April afternoon. Our school, our campus looked so beautiful. The 4,000 students came. They brought their loved ones, their family members. The field at our school was filled with approximately 10,000 Cambodian villagers. The stage was set and the government was coming to give us an award. My father, who had walked and prayed on those grounds since 1994, was there as well. Our teachers were there. We came to receive the award. Now, before we got to the stage to receive the award, the protocol people came to us and said, listen, there's a big shot, famous man who's coming today to give this award. When he comes, you can, don't mess this up, please. I know you Americans, you like to be free and wild. You got to be respectful in this setting. They said, listen, when he gets here, just stand over on the side, be really respectful. When he comes past you, don't look him in the eye. Don't talk to him. Like, please don't talk to him when he comes, then he'll come in and, you know, we'll get on the stage. He's going to give you the award. That's it. Don't mess this up. Our local friends were saying, I know you guys are wild and crazy. Please don't mess this up. This guy's a big timer. This is a big shot. We've got to behave. Be on your best behavior. That's hard for us from time to, especially missions folk. That's hard for us from time to time. But we said, okay. So we did it. We got, you know, we got there and um, here comes the entourage. Government Trucks, black SUVs coming down the dirt road. I don't know why government officials always have to drive black SUVs, but it is like across the world. Everyone does it. So here come the black SUVs down the dirt road to our school. We rush over and we line up getting ready for this man. I'm thinking, who is this man? They pull in and down comes the man and I'm over there. And I, I said, oh no. And I looked and across the field, my father is across the field playing with some kids. He wasn't in the line. He wasn't doing the grandpa, guys. Wasn't doing the protocol. Wasn't doing the whole thing. I said, oh, so I ran over there really quick. I said, dad, dad, the guy's here. We got to get over, get in the line. We got to do the thing. Don't look him in the eye. Don't talk to him. Don't mess this up. Come on, the guy's here to give us the award. And he said, oh, he'll come to me. I said, okay. I went back. I got it. Got in line. You know, I'm standing there. And here comes the entourage. And down they come. And they get down and you know, sure enough, that man walks across the field right over to where my father was. Comes over to him. My dad's playing with the kids. They turn around, they greet each other, and they walk up onto the stage. Looking back on it now, my dad was making a statement. God had given us that land. This was God's land. This isn't his land. We're seated high in heavenly places, folks. So they took to the stage. And this man turned out to be General Ki Kim Yan, the commander-in-chief of the armed forces that drove out Pol Pot and finished the killing fields, the deputy prime minister of the nation. And he was scheduled to share. Now, my father had no place to, to share on the, 
on the uh, whatever it was called, the, the program for the day, he had no time to share. But before the general took to the stage, my dad stood up and ran up to the microphone on the pulpit. Now I'm thinking, oh gosh, here we go. Now we're in trouble. Picture this, 10,000 villagers, the prime minister, deputy prime minister of the nation, all of his command, uh, commanders, all of, all of the, the military people there. And my dad just rushes ahead of him onto the pulpit. No one knows what he's going to say. And I'm freaking out thinking, oh no! He took to that pulpit and he looked out on all of the people. Now keep in mind, we had just been, these are our students, 4,000 students and their families, all 173 teachers who had given their lives to Jesus. My dad said, if you're here today and you believe that through the resurrection power of Jesus Christ, a generation will emerge to change this nation, say, I believe. And that entire crowd said, I believe. He said, say it again. They said, I believe. He said, say it again. They said, I believe. He had them stand up and say, we believe. This is a communist nation. This is a Buddhist nation. My dad turned around, looked at the general like this, and went and sat down. The general has to follow him. So he's next, and he comes up to the stage, and he looks at all of these people who have just unified in something. He's a politician. He said, this is a good thing. This is a good thing. He said, we as a government are working with these people, pointing over to us, to bring education to the nation of Cambodia. These are our partners. Now for you and I, wow, Pastor Matt, that's a cool story. For the local pastors who are there, all of the guns just aligned on their side. That's payday. They were bouncing around like crazy. The Buddhist monks who had gathered to pray had just lost a big, big battle. On that day, the man and the entourage invited us to expand from eight public schools to 488 public schools. Friends, today, I serve, and the ministry I serve, serves 488 public schools in Cambodia on a daily basis. That's 150,000 students daily are in our programs in these public schools. Which also means that every morning, 150,000 Cambodians in public schools start the day with, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread. Forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. Lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever and ever. Amen. So COVID. I've been in America for one full year. I haven't been in Cambodia which before COVID, I was there at least once a month. So COVID. Somebody had the nerve to tell me that there would never be a chance for the Lord's Prayer to be in public schools in America. I said, really? They said, yeah. We'll never have prayer in our public schools again. In my mind, I'm thinking of a Buddhist nation, a communist nation, where 150,000 kids are starting the day in public schools with the Lord's Prayer. Why? Because mathematics and science are through the roof. Why? Because there's hope in the schools that has never been there before. Why? Because the economy is bursting at the seams. Why? Because they believe in the resurrection power of Jesus Christ to change a nation. I went to a public school in America and someone said, whoa, 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 you can't use the word Jesus here. And I said, you just did. Guys, come on. Come on. Come on. Do you believe in the resurrection power of Jesus Christ to change a, a nation in this generation? Do you believe? Do you believe? 
It can happen. Prayer is the key. Prayer is the key. The Lord's Prayer, the simple place of agreement where He's in the midst of us, changing lives, changing nations. Oh, did He just hear you say, I believe? You better believe He just heard you confess that with your mouth, that you believe it can happen. That's all it takes for us, guys. Is it difficult? Sure. My favorite prayer that Jesus prayed, and we'll get to the word go briefly, <laughs> briefly. My favorite prayer that Jesus prayed was the one he prayed in the garden before he faced the cross. He's in the garden, bleeding from his pores and prayers, Scripture records. He's talking to his father. He's praying. He's talking to his father. You know the conversation I'm talking about. He says to his father, Father, if it be in your will, take this cup from me. In that moment, the sins of you and I are invading the space and he's receiving all that we have cast upon him. And he's pleading out a son to a father. If it be in your will, take this cup from me. Knowing that he's going to face the cross. Knowing that he's going to bear this for each and every one of us. Knowing that if he does that, it's the only way that you and I will be set free today in Somerset, Pennsylvania. Knowing he's got to face that cross. He calls out to his father. If it be in your will, take this cup from me. It's okay to call out to our Father and say, Help, help, help. I'm stuck in this. I'm stuck in this situation. Help me. The second portion of that prayer is what puts us in the place of victory today. Nevertheless, not my will, your will be done. Nevertheless, not my will, your will be done. Scripture records as soon as he said those words, ministering angels in Luke's gospel came to his side. After the resurrection, he gets up, we're in victory. And he says, all authority I give to you. John 17th chapter records, they received my words, they're abiding in me. My glory is your glory. Your glory is in me, it's in them. They will go throughout all the earth that they will witness your glory made manifest in them. Then Jesus says to these friends, which is what I'm going to say to you as friends, go, 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 go into all the earth. Go into all the earth. Bring them good news. Make disciples. Tell them that the kingdom of God is here. Go ye therefore and make disciples of all the nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit, teaching them to observe all things that I've commanded you. And lo, I am with you always, even to the end of the age. My challenge for us today Big question, what does low mean? No go, no low. What does low mean? In that prayer, our Father who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name, thy kingdom come, thy will be done. When we exchange our will today for his will and his way for our life, heaven, the things of heaven become clear and surround us. In heaven, we don't have sickness. In heaven, we don't have poverty. In heaven, we don't have identity issues. In heaven, we don't have racism. If we want the low, we got to go. If there's anything you take from my stories and ramblings here this morning, if you want the low, you got to go. Go where, Pastor Matt? 
everywhere. Go how, Pastor Matt? In prayer. Go when, Pastor Matt? Now. And watch, give witness to the things of heaven being made real in your life and around your life. Where are you to go? Somerset. Some of you might hear today, I'm to go to Cambodia. Let's go. We've got a bus outside. We'll go straight to the airport. No, I'm just teasing. Some of you are going to be called into your workplace. Some of you are going to be called into your families. Praise God. Go. Well, how am I going to do it, Matt? The, the battle's too strong. Lo, I am with you always. Prayer keeps that low real around us. This is the Great Commission. This is what He told us to do. This is how the glory of God, all of His goodness, all of His compassion will fill the earth. I want to take time to pray together here as a church because there's a rich history in this church of many generations before us from what I've read, from what I understand who have gone in this commission, who have taken the gospel to all the earth and the families the families who God has blessed with the low as they've went. Some of that remnant is sitting here this morning. If I can do anything, any gift to you is to stir up that charge. Yet again, say, I believe in the resurrection power of Jesus Christ. Yet again, say, I will exchange my will for His will. Yet again, say, this church will be the house God uses to transform Somerset, Pennsylvania. Yet again, enter in to the harvest of those who came before us. Yet again, say, here I am, Lord, send me. I'm going to close here in prayer. And while I close, I want to ask that this be a day you make a statement. If you're saying, okay, Matt, I'm feeling a call to go to the nations to pre the, preach the gospel. I want you to come forward and pray with me. If you're here today and you're saying, okay, Matt, I need to exchange my will for his will again in my life. I'm going to ask you to stand here in a moment and make that commitment again in prayer. If you're here today and you've never received Jesus as your personal Lord and Savior, this is the day. If you're here today and you're not sure that you have Oh man, this is, this is your time. This is your time. And if you're here today and you'd like to receive a blessing from the Lord in the, in the area of healing, I also want to pray with you. That's a lot. That's a loaded altar call right there. Let me go back through it. Number one, I'm going to come down here and we're going to spend some time in prayer. Number one, if you're feeling a call to go to the nations, where, whether it be China or Cambodia or Costa Rica, I want you to please come up here and meet me so we can pray. Number two, if this is a day for you to commit, lay down your will for His will, yet again, I'm going to ask you to stand and pray. Number three, that special healing. If you need a healing touch in your body, I'm going to ask you to come forward and pray. And also, in addition, if you've never received Jesus, come up and pray. So let's please, if you're here today and you are ready to say, not my will, your will be done, please stand with me. Amen. And if I might be so bold, could we come up and sing a song? Could, could we? Would that be okay, Pastor? I don't know how we're planning we to close. Ready. You have a song ready? Okay, if we could come up and, and, and close with that song. And while that song, while we're closing with that song, first of all, thank you for standing. Thank you for standing. Jesus knows. He sees it. While we're singing this song, if that's you, if you're one of those who is feeling the call to go to the nations, I'm going to come right down here and just pray. I want to meet you. I want to pray with you. Okay? Let's go to the last song. Uh, the last song. And also, if, if you're somebody who's looking for physical healing, I believe that we serve a mighty God and a Holy Spirit who heals.
the sick. I've seen it too many times. I cannot deny what I have witnessed. And if you need healing today, let's pray and believe God for it. May a great testimony go forth through our church. I'll pray and then we can sing. Heavenly Father, we give you praise. Lord, I thank you for this house that you've set apart. Lord, I thank you for stirring us with your Holy Spirit today. Father, I ask that you would be glorified, be praised, delight in the commitments of your servants and your friends to go forth from this house today in your will for their lives. Oh, I know this makes your heart happy. Now, Father, as we worship you, Holy Spirit, I ask that you would come and move amongst us Secure this call to the mission field in our hearts. Bring healing to the sick. And draw those who don't know you to you. I thank you for this church. Blessed I ask in Jesus' name. Amen.